So I decided to do my presentation on the hydrodynamics of swimming fish. I first got interested in this when I saw some of the fish in my fish tank <coughs> swimming against the current of their circulation pump. So here's a quick video of that. I thought maybe I could uh, model them as airfoils and use star CCM or X-foil to get some values for coefficient of drag or coefficient of lift, look at their pressure distribution, uh, maybe try and calculate uh, power or efficiency or things like that. But after uh, doing some research, I realized that my model and experiment uh, just wasn't up to par with what was out there. So I decided to just focus on the research and try and tackle the uh, question of how to fish swim and the hydrodynamics around them. So before we look at the hydrodynamics, let's talk about the fish themselves quickly. So uh, this is the basic anatomy of a of a fish. Most fish have pectoral fins, a dorsal fin, a caudal fin, an anal fin, and pelvic fins. And all these fins are used as valuable, valuable control surfaces, but uh, the pectoral fin is one of the most important. And we can separate some broad groups that we can talk about by examining the pectoral fin position and orientation. So in this picture, the pectoral fin is more uh, vertically attached, and same with this sunfish and this anglerfish. These fish usually uh, have more control over their pectoral fin and can use it for things like turning, braking, and uh, dynamically affecting the wake that hits their tail. Uh, fish uh, like the sturgeon or the shark who have more horizontal pectoral fins don't really have that much control over them and use them uh, more for stability and uh, also some maneuvering, but just not as much as uh, these vertical pectoral fin fish fishes. You can also separate some uh, broad groups by talking about their body shape. So a fish like this uh, sturgeon or this fish up here, we might consider a slender body fish. While this sunfish, we could consider a uh, flat bodied fish. And this angler fish might be considered a blunt body fish. So now let's uh, separate them further uh, with talking about the swimming mechanisms they use. So two broad groups are fish who use their fins to swim up here and fish who use their bodies and tails to swim down here. So fish who use their fins to swim uh, can be divided into three categories, dorsal, anal, and pectoral, based on which fin they use most. And fish who use their body and tail to swim can be categorized as uh, trunk or caudal. Trunk if they use mostly their body and caudal if they use only their tail. Uh, another useful uh, thing to talk about is undulation versus oscillation. So undulation is more of a sine wave uh, propagating down the body like this eel or the stingray up here. Well, oscillation is more of a heaving moment like when a tuna swims. Uh, imagine you're putting your hand out and keeping it rigid and moving it back and forth. It's that sort of uh, motion. Uh, we can divide undulation and oscillation into uh, these four subcategories going from an eel to a tuna with these uh, two intermediate steps. So I'll just show you guys some uh, cool videos I found so maybe you can understand this a little better. So here's a tuna swimming. And you can see he's only moving his tail. He's not uh, oscillating yeah, his head at all. And then that compared with uh, this video of Marlin, where you can see he undulates uh, more his whole body as he swims. I thought this video was uh, really cool, and you see later he uh, uses his fins as a control surface. Even though he's got uh, horizontal fins, uh, he still has uh, pretty good control over them. back to the presentation and let's talk about the last char characteristic of fish that I want to talk about which is skin texture so there's obviously a lot of different fish in the sea but most fish uh, have scale like structures on their skin and uh, mostly scale like structures are just there to reduce drag and they do this by tripping the boundary layer which delays separation and uh, therefore reduces pressure drag it can reduce skin friction and therefore increase propulsion efficiency overall. It's also interesting to note that on this shark, he has multiple different uh, types of scales. And you can see the ones closest to the head 
uh, are more flat and allow the shark to uh, glide through the water, uh, keeping the flow laminar over its head until uh, separation is an issue and it needs to trip the boundary layer and uh, allow it to uh, allow it to delay separation until it reaches the tail. So now let's look at our first study. Uh, this study looks at different tail designs and the leading edge vortices uh, coming off of them. So this is obviously a simulation study. It applies to corangiform swimmers, which is that uh, first group uh, after tuna. And uh, the simulations were run at two regimes, transitional regime and inertial regime at strong hole numbers of 0.6 and 0.25. So just a quick uh, refresher, transitional means uh, both laminar and turbulent and inertial means fully turbulent. And uh, most fish's skin creates a uh, turbulent uh, flow. So this isn't uh, so, so unrealistic. Uh, let's touch on the strong hole number before we uh, move on. So the strong hole number has to do with this effect here of uh, vortex shedding. And it's defined as the vortex shedding frequency times the characteristic length over the free stream velocity. And we can modify this formula for our use with fish by changing the frequency to oscillation frequency of the tail, the uh, characteristic length to peak to peak amplitude of the tail, and u stays free stream velocity. And this uh, effect is pretty common. It happens obviously here in the atmosphere around this island. Uh, it happens around pier poles in power plants and things. It happens around towers. And uh, a study we look at later shows it happening around fish swimming. Uh, let's talk about it a little more and talk about the magnitude of the strong hole number. So at high strong hole numbers, uh, the oscillations dominate the flow. First of all, strong hole number measures uh, side velocity versus forward velocity. So high strong hole number will have a high side velocity, but not much forward velocity. So this picture isn't exact, but you can imagine these vortices uh, really trying to pile up because the flow isn't taking them away uh, too quick. So you can get some uh, turbulent oscillatory flow. At low stronghold numbers, which is below around 0.2, the flow is very quick uh, moving back and not much side movement. So you get this sort of shape where the vortices try and form, but they get swept away by the fast moving fluid. Uh, the Goldilocks zone is a medium stronghold number between 0.2 and 0.4. And this is when around a cylinder you get a von Karman vortex street. And, uh, it's interesting to note that uh, oscillatory fish and flying birds and insects stay at this medium strong hole number because their propulsion efficiency is highest. So we should uh, expect to see uh, something resembling this von Karman uh, vortex street. So now let's get back to the simulation and we'll put trailing vortices off to the side for a bit and uh, just talk about leading edge vortices. So a leading edge vortice is formed when the area of attack of the wing is uh, such that it creates a separation bubble at the leading edge of the wing, like in this picture of the bee. Uh, and it's very beneficial for uh, flying objects when the flow uh, reattaches to the wing and maintains the cutter condition, because then you don't get all the negative effects of full flow separation, like uh, very increased pressure drag. You just get the good effect of having a low pressure uh, spot on your wing, which increases uh, the pressure uh, di distribution and lift. And we already talked about uh, leading edge vortices when we looked at delta wings. So this is a leading edge vortice over a delta wing, and it's uh, similar to what's happening on a bee's wing. So how can this be useful for fish? So imagine turning this bee sideways and you get exactly what this uh, simulation shows on the fish. So the fish is gaining more thrust from this effect. Uh, these are the results from the simulation and you can see that uh, there's inertial on the left and transitional on the right. And in the inertial regime, you can see that the uh, leading edge vorticity stays attached in all three cases, in all three tail designs. So the fish is gaining some uh, benefit from it. And you can also see that the more delta shaped the tail, the uh, better it does. It's easy to see on this transitional regime where these delta shaped tails are uh, trying to form the leading edge vortice and make it reattach, but uh, it's still just uh, separating while this tail down here is 
not really doing a good job at all. And it's interesting to note that in the inertial regime, uh, fish like to make a turbulent flow with their skin. So uh, this uh, may be a common occurrence. Uh, and another, the researchers ran another simulation to see if this effect was due to the delta-ness of the tails or just the oscillation of the fish. So they ran a final simulation using a rectangular tail. So obviously this rectangular tail has no uh, capability by itself, just enough flow to create a uh, leading edge vortice. But by the oscillation of the tail, it, uh, a leading edge vortice still uh, forms and stays attached. Uh, I do question the validity of this study a bit because it uh, has some limitations. First of all, it doesn't uh, consider that a fish's tail can roll during propulsion. It's not just a straight back and forth uh, oscillation. Also, it uh, doesn't take into, a, a, take into account the effect of fins, uh, different body shapes, skin textures, maybe unsteady oscillation, what that effect is. So I don't want you guys to think that uh, fish are always swimming around with these leading edge vortices attached to them. Maybe it's only at certain uh, times in their uh, tail beat or at certain velocities and things like that. But it's just an effect that you can watch out for and that can uh, potentially provide the fish some more thrust. So uh, let's look at the second study of this presentation. And this one deals more with trailing vortices and it does that by uh, comparing heaving swimming versus undulation swimming. So again, heaving is on this right, like the tuna, and undulation is on the left, like an eel, or this uh, subcarangifore, who is more like a fish. An eel is a, a very, very uh, undulating uh, swimmer. So uh, this simulation used a NACA airfoil and modified sine waves to get these uh, different mechanisms. And these are some of the uh, formulas they use. So we've seen these, the uh, viscous force, the pressure force on the fish. So that's the total uh, drag force on the fish. Then they calculate efficiency of the fish's swimming and uh, power that the fish uses. And to synthesize the results, they use uh, two different criteria for the vorticity. They use vorticity criteria like we've seen and Q criteria, and all Q cr criteria does is compare rotation and strain rates. So this first term is rotation rates, and the second term is strain rates. So if Q is positive, the rotation is taking over the strain, which means you're inside a vortice, and therefore where Q is zero, uh, but going to get positive, that's the uh, vortex boundary layers. And the simulation also uses a moving mesh and therefore you need the geometric conversion law and uh, is governed by the Navier-Stokes equations. So now I'll show you their mesh. You can see they really care about the trailing vortices behind the fish and this is their moving mesh uh, region where the flow uh, hits this moving body. They really want a accurate result so they use this uh, more sophisticated simulation technique. And you can see they used uh, plenty of nodes they use the Blasius equation to make sure the laminar boundary layer thickness or to estimate it. And they uh, used a Lagrangian Eulerian approach to uh, in this moving mesh region. I also put here the uh, box diagram for the simulation just so you can see uh, some of the feedback loops that they do uh, to uh, decide if it's convergent or if they should uh, end the simulation or not. So now let's look at the results from this study. So if we look at power, first let's start with undulation, which is the orange, red, and green, uh, increasing in Reynolds number. So you can see the orange and red are down here at not much power, but once the Reynolds number gets really high, the power uh, is obviously gonna increase that needs to be used to uh, swim at the same speed. Uh, now, that, now let's look at heaving, which uh, uses a lot more power you can see that the first heaving is on par with the uh, other two undulations. But once you get uh, to the middle Reynolds number, your power goes up a lot. And once you get to this final Reynolds number, your power uh, is way higher than any of the other cases. It's also interesting to note that uh, as the Stromhold number goes up, the power used goes up to swim at the same speed. This is because, this is because as the Stromhold number goes up, there's more uh, sideways velocity than forward velocity. So the fish is kicking more uh, 
force to the side than to the fo forward. So it's obviously going to take more power for him to swim at the same speed forward. Uh, now we can look at efficiency. So uh, undulation is again orange, red, and green. And you can see that undulation is way more efficient than uh, heaving, which we would expect uh, due to this power curve. You can also see that uh, all of these uh, efficiency peaks happen from one to maybe uh, 0.2 or 0.1. And these graphs use double the Stronghold number because they're using the tail tip Stronghold number. So uh, these results line up with the uh, Goldilocks zone we talked about earlier, going from around 0.15 or something to uh, 0.5 or, or some value like that. So these are in the Goldilocks zone like we would expect. So now let's look at these uh, trailing vortices. The main reason I looked at this study, so we can see at low Stronghold numbers for undulation, these vortices are trying to form on the coming off the fish's tail and you can see maybe one there, but uh, it's very hard for them to form and they're not very strong, only uh, 25 at the max uh, vorticity. These graphs are showing vorticity. Uh, at the high stronghold number for undulation, you can see that there's a clear uh, vortex streak coming off the fish and it's actually a reverse von Karman vortex streak with the vortex vortices swirling out from the fish rather than swirling into the middle. And you can see there are of uh, much more magnitude of vorticity. Now this high stronghold number is around 0.6 and you can see that the vortices are getting uh, very cramped. So any number uh, above that 0 0.8, 0 0.9 would be, getting, uh, would be getting a mixing of these vortices. So now let's look at the heaving uh, for a low stronghold number where the flow is very fast. You can see that the tail uh, kicks out these uh, elliptical vortices and they're getting uh, taken away by the flow and again it's not very uh, high vorticity for the heaving motion it's more just a uh, force going in each one of these directions that has some slight vorticity to it and then this high, this high strong number for heaving uh, I couldn't really understand these results I thought maybe uh, because it's heaving back and forth more uh, force is going to the side, like we said, at a high stronghold number. So maybe some of the force is coming back around the fish and creating these uh, weird extra vortices and things. But I wasn't exactly sure on uh, this result. Uh, the last thing we'll look at is the pressure coefficient for these two cases. So uh, just undulation and heating. Don't really worry about the stronghold numbers. I just picked these ones because they looked uh, the best for what I wanted to explain. So for undulation, you can see that the force and the pressure moves down the body as it, uh, as it goes through one tail beat. So you can see that uh, the pressure bubble starts here and then gets pushed out the back as a new pressure bubble forms in the front. The front pressure bubble continues backwards until it reaches the back and then the process continues. And uh, as for the heaving, you can see it's more of just these lines crossing over straight. It doesn't uh, travel down the body like it does in undulation. So you can see that this bottom line and this top line almost just cross over and uh, switch places, which is uh, indicative of heaving and what we would think. The pressure just goes from high pressure on one side to low pressure on the other. It doesn't uh, undulate down the body like in this case. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, so now that we have uh, talked about some trailing vortices, let's see how these can affect uh, schooling fish. So we already know that fish gain energetic benefits from swimming in a school. This is evident by uh, reduced oxygen consumption and lower tail beat frequency at the back of the school. These are previous studies that have been run. Uh, so this simulation study uses MPCD, a particle-based simulation, which lends itself very well to uh, multi-object uh, interactions like a bunch of fish in a school. So how they do this is they propagate the particles for a bit and then uh, to conserve computing power, they portion the simulation into cells and conserve the velocity and rotation of each cell. Uh, 
like the mean velocity and mean rotation of every cell, and then they propagate these uh, bigger cells for a bit to get their results. And these cells aren't big, they're still very, very small, but uh, they are bigger than uh, point particles, like they were using this first step. And this technique conserves mass, momentum, energy, and uh, accurately simulates Navier-Stokes to 1500s Reynolds number. And this simulation is run at 1100, so they're well within the range that it can be uh, validated. They also have different criteria to ensure that the boundary layer uh, is always bigger than the size of the cells and that the speed of sound is never uh, breached. And these are ran for uh, corandiform swimmers, uh, slender body fish. Specifically, they used a mullet uh, body, uh, 12 centimeters. And again, they used a modified sine wave to get this uh, swimming mechanism. So they looked at four different schooling configurations for 2D infinite, infinite schools. They looked at swimming uh, in a line, swimming side by side, a combination of both of these uh, that they called rectangular and a diamond configuration. And I'll go back and I'll show you. This is uh, behind, this is side by side, rectangular and diamond. It's just offset a bit. Uh, so they also varied the distances in these configurations to get additional insight. And they used the frout efficiency to measure uh, if this was a good configuration or bad configuration. So let's look at the results. So all the configurations apart from side by side uh, have higher frout efficiency than just a solitary fish. So the fish would like to be in these uh, different configurations. Uh, these configurations, the beneficial effects decrease with distance because these vortices start to uh, decay in the water, but uh, they still remain higher than a solitary fish because of the slow decay in water. Uh, diamond and rectangular configurations were the best uh, at distances above 0.4 body lengths. So this is because the fish behind can capture some of these uh, vortices and use them to their advantage to kick off higher strength vortices, giving them more force forward. And therefore they have to move their tail less and uh, things like that. But you have to watch out because uh, below 0.4 body lengths, diamond takes a huge plunge in efficiency. And you can see in this picture, if the fish in front are too close, their uh, von Karman vortex streets or the reverse von Karman vortex streets interact and create an almost laminar flow coming to hit this diagonal fish. So that's obviously very bad for this uh, fish and reduces its efficiency drastically. And that's why a diamond takes a huge plunge when you get a, a very tight packing. So now let's look at uh, an experimental study. And this study looks at fish acceleration and how fish can create more thrust uh, as they're swimming. Uh, so this is useful because in nature, fish rarely uh, swim steadily. Usually they're accelerating forward, then being pushed back, accelerating forward, things like that like we saw in the video uh, with the marlin. And um, so there's two main ways that fish can uh, increase their thrust. They can either increase the force of each tail beat or they can change the direction of the force if they're capable of that. So uh, that's this picture up here. You can see in the default case, uh, the angles are just this and the power is uh, this arrow. But you can see in the second case, the angle has changed a bit. So there's gonna be more resultant force forward. And you can see in this one, the force has increased a lot and there's gonna be a higher resultant forward. Uh, the study uses this kind of setup where they have a, um, put particles in the water that they can then uh, shine on with this laser and record with this high-speed camera to track the particles. It's called PIV. And they used a custom MATLAB code and uh, it's interesting to see that the centers and diameters were manually identified after looking at the uh, results. So now let's look at a few of the uh, equations that they used. They used the regular old circulation equation and uh, used that to calculate the force that must have been used to create those vortices. So this is the force of those vortices coming back. So the, the resultant force would push the fish forward. And then this is the uh, total drag force. So they have the force of drag like we're used to, 
but they also have a force of acceleration. And that's because fish face a uh, compromise. The faster they accelerate, the more they undulate their body, but undulating their body uh, more increases their, um, their fluid dynamic added mass, which increases the drag on them. So the faster they go, the more drag uh, they get on them and the harder it is to go any faster. And you can see that the two mechanisms are shown in this equation. To increase the axial force, you can either increase the force or you can change the angle. So now let's look at the uh, results. So these are the results of the study. And you can see at a low acceleration, the vortices aren't very powerful. As the acceleration is increasing, the vorticinal strength is increasing. So you can tell that the, for the fish is using more force to create these vortices. And at this very high acceleration, you can see that the vortices are very strong. And you can maybe tell that the angle they're at is a little more squished and a little more uh, pointed backwards, but it's uh, hard to tell because that's not the main uh, mechanism that the fish uses. So how do we decide what, the, what mechanism the fish is using? We uh, set one to zero and see the effect of only changing the force. And then we set the force to, to constant and we see the effect of only changing the angle. And if you do that, you realize that the change in force accounts for 78%, while the change in angle only accounts for 24%. So the fish is mostly changing the force, but he is also changing the angle a bit to get some extra uh, efficiency in from it. So now let's look at our second experimental study. This uses the same technique, but uh, a little more advanced. Instead of tracking individual particles, it tracks the grayscale to uh, make this 2D matrix of the velocities. It's just a little more advanced than uh, tracking the individual particles alone. And they don't use any of those equations to calculate total force. They take the momentum of the rings uh, coming out from the fish and uh, take the force that it takes to create those vortices and that must be the force pushing the fish forward. Exactly how they did in the previous study, but uh, I'm not sure if they use those same equations for the drag force or anything like that. Uh, so it's interesting to see they studied two different fish and at the same relative speed with body length, one fish only produces one vortex ring while the other produces two on every uh, fin beat. I forgot to mention that uh, this study focuses on fish that use their fins to swim, while the other experimental study was focused on uh, fish still using their tails that we looked at in the rest of the presentation. And you can see that these uh, vortex uh, rings are calculated by looking at the three views on the fish, getting these jets and these vortices uh, coming off from those different views, and then combining them all into one uh, vortex ring at a certain orientation. Uh, so this study is important in um, trying when trying to decide what's a good fish, what's a bad fish. So when studying fish, usually swimming performance is based on uh, just thrust produced or muscle power or something like that. But these values can be gated by the fish's ability to reorient its vortices. So this fish may be uh, a lot stronger than this fish, so we think it's better, but it can but this weaker fish can reorient its vortices so it can swim actually much faster than uh, this fish can. So let's talk about that uh, when looking at the results. So you can see it here that surf perch can reorient its vertices and swim uh, much faster than the sunfish who uh, actually reorients its vertices pointing more outwards, giving it more stability when it's trying to swim faster but not increasing its uh, propulsion efficiency forward. Uh, we talked about these von Karman streets forming at that Goldilocks zone and we talked about how a fish can uh, create a reverse von Karman street as it swims. Now it's interesting to note that uh, these reverse von Karman streets can come off the dorsal fins as well. So here you have the dorsal fin and the tail fin of one fish and you can see that the dorsal fin undulating creates this uh, first vortice and that vortice is captured by the tail of the other fish or the tail of the fish creating a stronger vortice coming off which entails more force pushing the fish forward 
this is the same um, mechanism that makes uh, schooling fish uh, increase propulsion efficiency or fry efficiency. And it's just interesting to see that it can happen on one fish uh, by itself. So these fish are taking constantly taking advantage of these uh, vortices and stuff to increase their propulsion efficiency. So I think that is it for the presentation. Uh, thank you.